Chapter 7 of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter 7 Up the Edisto. In reading military history, one finds the main interest to lie undoubtedly in the great campaigns where a man, a regiment, a brigade is but a pawn in the game. But there is a charm also in the more free and adventurous life of partisan warfare, where, if the total sphere be humbler, yet the individual has more relative importance, and the scene of action is more personal and keen. This is the reason given by the eccentric revolutionary biographer Weems for writing the life of Washington first, and then that of Marion. And there were, certainly, high in the early adventures of the colored troops of the Department of the South, some of the same elements of picturesqueness that belonged to Marion's band on the same soil, with the added feature that the blacks were fighting for their personal liberties, of which Marion had helped to deprive them. It is stated by Major General Gilmore, in his Siege of Charleston, as one of the three points of his preliminary strategy, that an expedition was sent up by the Edisto River to destroy a bridge on the Charleston and Savannah Railway. As one of the early raids of the colored troops, this expedition may deserve narration, though it was, in a strategic point of view, a disappointment. It has already been told, briefly and on the whole with truth, by Greenlee and others, but I will venture on a more complete account. The project dated back earlier than General Gilmore's siege, and had originally no connection with that movement. It had been formed by Captain Trowbridge and myself in camp, and was based on the facts learned from the men, General Saxton and Colonel W. W. H. Davis, the successive post commanders, had both favoured it. It had been also approved by General Hunter before his sudden removal, though he regarded the bridge as secondary affair, because there was another railway communication between the two cities. But, as the main object was to obtain permission to go, I tried to make the most of all results which might follow. While it was very clear that the raid would harass and confuse the enemy, and be the means of bringing away many of the slaves, General Hunter had therefore accepted the project mainly as a stroke for freedom and black recruits, and General Gilmore because anything that looked towards action found favour in his eyes, and because it would be convenient to him at that time to effect a diversion, if nothing more. It must be remembered that, after the first capture of Port Royal, the outlying plantations along the whole southern coast were abandoned, and the slaves withdrawn into the interior. It was necessary to ascend some river for thirty miles in order to reach the black population at all. This ascent could only be made by night, and it was slow process, and the smoke of a steamboat could be seen for a great distance. The streams were usually shallow, winding and muddy, and the difficulties of navigation were such as to require a full moon and a flooded tide. It was really no easy matter to bring everything to bear, especially as every projected raid must be kept a secret so far as possible. However, we were now somewhat familiar with such undertakings, half military, half naval, and the thing to be done on the Edisto was precisely what had been proved to be practicable on the St. Mary's and the St. John's, to drop anchor before the enemy's door some morning at daybreak without his having dreamed of our approach. Since a raid made by Colonel Montgomery up the Cumbayi two months before, the vigilance of the rebels had increased. But we had information that upon the South Edisto, or Pompon River, the rice plantations were still being actively worked by a large number of Negroes, in reliance on obstructions placed at the mouth of that narrow stream where it joins the main river, some twenty miles from the coast. This point was known to be further protected by a battery of unknown strength at Wilttown Bluff a commanding and defensible position. The obstructions consisted of a row of strong wooden piles across the river, but we convinced ourselves that these must now be much decayed, and that Captain Trowbridge, an excellent engineer officer, could remove them by the proper apparatus. Our proposition was to man the John Adams, an armed ferry boat, which had before done us much service, and which had now reverted to the pursuits of peace, it is said, on the East Boston line, to ascend in this to Wilttown Bluff, silence the battery, and clear the passage through the obstructions. Leaving the John Adams to protect this point, 
we could then ascend the smaller stream with two light draft boats and perhaps burn the bridge, which was ten miles higher, before the enemy could bring sufficient force to make our position at Wilton Bluff untenable. The expedition was organized essentially upon this plan. The smaller boats were the Enoch Dean, a river steamboat which carried a ten-pound parrot gun and a small howitzer, and a little mosquito of a tug, the Governor Milton, upon which, with the greatest difficulty, we found room for two twelve-pound Armstrong guns, with their gunners, forming a section of the 1st Connecticut Battery under Lieutenant Clinton, aided by a squad from my own regiment under Captain James. The John Adams carried, if I remember rightly, two parrot guns of twenty and ten pounds calibre, and a howitzer or two. The whole force of men did not exceed two hundred and fifty. We left Beaufort, S.C., on the afternoon of July ninth, 1863. In former narrations I have sufficiently described the charm of a moonlight ascent into a hostile country upon an unknown stream, the dark and silent banks, the rippling water, the wail of the reed birds, the anxious watch, the breathless listening, the veiled lights, the whispered orders. To this was now to be added the vexation of insufficient pilotage, for our negro guide knew only of the upper river, and as it finally proved, not even that, while to take us over the bar which obstructed the main stream, we must borrow a pilot from Captain Dutch, whose gunboat blockaded that point. This active naval officer, however, whose boat expeditions had penetrated all the lower branches of those streams, could not supply our want, and we borrowed from him not only a pilot, but a surgeon to replace our own, who had been prevented by an accident from coming with us. Thus accompanied, we steamed over the bar in safety, and had a peaceful ascent, past the island of Jehosi, the fine estate of Governor Aiken, then left undisturbed by both sides, and fired our first shell into the camp at Wilton Bluff at four o'clock in the morning. The battery, whether fixed or movable, we knew not, met us with a promptness that proved very short-lived. After three shots it was silent, but we could not tell why. The bluff was wooded, and we could see but little. The only course was to land under cover of the guns. As the firing ceased and the smoke cleared away, I looked across the rice fields which lay beneath the bluff. The first sunbeams glowed upon their emerald leaves and on the blossoming hedges along the rectangular dikes. What were those black dots which everywhere appeared? Those moist meadows had become alive with human heads, and along each narrow path came a straggling file of men and women, all on a run for the river. I went ashore with a boatload of troops at once. The landing was difficult and marshy. The astonished negroes tugged us up the bank and gazed at us as if we had been Cortez or Columbus. They kept arriving by land, much faster than we could come by water. Every moment increased the crowd, the jostling, the mutual clinging, on that miry foothold. What a scene it was! With the wild faces, eager figures, strange garments, it seemed as if one of the poor things revenantly suggested, like nothing but de judgment day. Presently they began to come from the houses also, with their little bundles on their heads, then with larger bundles. Old women trotting on the narrow paths would kneel to pray a little prayer, still balancing the bundle, and then would suddenly spring up, urged by the accumulation of procession from behind, and would move on till irresistibly compelled by the thankfulness to dip down for another invocation. Reaching us, every human being must grasp our hands and amid exclamations of, Bress you, Massa, and Bress de Lord, at the rate of four of the latter ascriptions to one of the former. Women brought children on their shoulders, small black boys leaned on their black little brothers easily inky, and gravely depositing them shook hands. Never had I seen human beings so clad, or rather so unclad, in such amazing squalidness and destitution of garments. I recall one small urchin without a rag of clothing save the basque waist of a lady's dress, bristling with whalebones and worn wrong side before, beneath which his smooth ebony legs emerged like those of an ostrich from its plumage. How weak is imagination, how cold is memory, that I ever cease for a day in my life to see before me the picture of that astounding scene. Yet at the time we were perforce a little impatient of all this piety, protestation, and hand-pressing, for the vital thing was to ascertain what force had been stationed at the bluff, and whether it was yet withdrawn. The slaves, on the other hand, 
were too much absorbed by their prospective freedom to aid us in taking any further steps to secure it. Captain Trowbridge, who had by this time landed at a different point, got quite into despair over the seeming deafness of the people to all questions. How many soldiers were there on the bluff? he asked of the first comer. Massa, the man said, stutting terribly, I c c c Tell me, how many soldiers are there? roared Trowbridge, in his mighty voice, and all but shaking the poor old thing in his thirst for information. O oh, Massa, recommenced in terror the incapacitated witness, I c c carpenter holding up eagerly a little stump of a hatchet, his sole treasure, as if his profession ought to excuse from all military opinions. I wish that it were possible to present all this scene from the point of view of the slaves themselves. It can be most nearly done, perhaps, by quoting the description given by a similar scene on the Kumbahi River by a very aged man who had been brought down on the previous raid already mentioned. I wrote it down in a tent long after, while the old man recited his tale with much gesticulation at the door, and it is by far the best glimpse I have ever had through a negro's eyes at these wonderful birthdays of freedom. De people was all hoein' massa, said the old man. Dey was a hoein' in the rice fields when de gumboats come. Den every man drop dem ho and de left de rice. De massa he stand and call, run to de woods for hide, Yankee come, sell you to Cuba, run for hide. Every man he run, and my God, run all tud away. Massa stand in de wood, peep, peep, fade for truss, afraid to truss. He say, run to de wood, and every man run by him, straight to de boat. De brack soldier, so presumptuous, dey come right ashore, hold up de head. Fust thing I know, dere a barn, ten thousand bushel rough rice, all in a blaze, dem massa's great house all crackling up de roof. Didn't I care for see em blaze? Law, massa didn't care nothin at all. Was gwine to de boat. Dawes Don Quixote could not surpass the sublime absorption to which the old gaunt man, with arm uplifted, described this stage of affairs, till he ended in a shrewd chuckle worthy of Sancho Panza. Then he resumed. De brack soldiers so presumptuous. This he repeated three times, slowly shaking his head in an ecstasy of admiration. It flashed upon me that the apparition of a black soldier must amaze those still in bondage, much as a butterfly just from the chrysalis might astound his fellow grubs. I inwardly vowed that my soldiers at least should be as presumptuous as I could make them. Then he went on. Old woman and I go down to de boat. Den they say behind us, Rebels comin', rebels comin'. Old woman say, Come ahead, come plenty ahead. I have nothin' on but my shirt and pantaloon. Old woman, one single frock he hab on, and one handkerchief on he head. I left all two of my blanky and run for de rebel come, and den day didn't come, didn't trust for come. I's eighty eight year old massa, my old massa lowns kept all de ages in a big book, and when we come to age of sense, we mark em down every year, so I know. Too old for come, massa joking, never too old for de leave de land a bondage, I old. But great food for children, give thousand tank every day. Young people can go through, massa, but de old folk must go slow. Such emotions as these, no doubt, were inspired by our arrival, but we could only hear their hasty utterance in passing, our duty being with the small force already landed, to take possession of the bluff. Ascending with proper precautions the wooded hill, we soon found ourselves in the deserted camp of a light battery amid scattered remaining equipments and suggestions of a very unattractive breakfast. As soon as possible, skirmishes were thrown out through the woods to the farther edge of the bluff, while a party searched the houses, finding the usual large supply of furniture and pictures brought up for safety from below, but no soldiers. Captain Trowbridge had then got the John Adams beside the row of piles, and went to work for their removal. Again, I had the exciting sensation of being within the hostile lines, the eager explorations, the doubts, the watchfulness, the listening for every sound of coming hoofs. Presently a horse's tread was heard in earnest, but it was a squad of our own men bringing in two captured cavalry soldiers. One of these, a sturdy fellow, submitted quietly to his lot, only begging that, whenever he should be evacuated from the bluff, a note should be left behind stating that he was a prisoner. The other, a very young man, 
and a member of the rebel troop, a sort of cadet corpse among the Charleston youths, came to me in great wrath, complaining that the corporal of our squad had kicked him after he had surrendered. His air of offended prize was very rueful, and it did indeed seem a pathetic reversal of fortunes for the two races. To be sure, the youth was a scion from one of the foremost families of South Carolina, and when I considered the wrongs which the black race had encountered from those of his blood, first and last, it seemed as if the most scrupulous recording angel might tolerate one final kick to square the account. But I reproved the corporal, who respectfully disclaimed the charge, and said the kick was an incident of the scuffle. It certainly was not their habit to show such poor malice. They thought too well of themselves. His demeanour seemed less lofty, but perhaps piteous, when he implored me not to put him on board any vessel which was to ascend the upper stream, and hinted, by awful implications, the danger of such ascent. This meant torpedoes, a peril which we treated in those days with rather mistaken contempt. But we found none on the Edisto, and it may be that it was only a foolish attempt to alarm us. Meanwhile, Trowbridge was toiling away at the row of piles, which proved easier to draw out than to saw asunder, either work being hard enough. It took far longer than we had hoped, and we saw noon approach and the tide fall rapidly, taking with it, inch by inch, our hopes of effecting a surprise at the bridge. During this time, and indeed all day, the detachments on shore under Captains Whitney and Sampson were having occasional skirmishes with the enemy, while the coloured people were swarming to the shore or running to and fro like ants with the poor treasures of their houses. Our busy quartermaster, Mr. Bingham, who died afterwards from the overwork of that sultry day, was transporting the refugees on board the steamer, or hunting up bales of cotton, or directing the burning of rice houses, in accordance with our orders. No dwelling houses were destroyed or plundered by our men, Sherman's bummers not having yet arrived, although I asked no questions as to what the plantation negroes might bring in their great bundles. One piece of property, I must admit, seemed a lawful capture, a United States dress-sword of the old pattern, which had belonged to the rebel general who afterwards gave the order to bury Colonel Shaw with his niggers. That I have retained, not without some satisfaction to this day. A passage having been cleared at last, and the tide having turned by noon, we lost no time in attempting the ascent, leaving the bluff to be held by the John Adams, and by a small force on shore. We were scarcely above the obstructions, however, when the little tug went aground, and the Enoch Dean, ascending a mile farther, had an encounter with a battery on the right, perhaps our old enemy, and drove it back. Soon after, she also ran aground, a misfortune of which our opponent strangely took no advantage, and, on getting off, I thought it best to drop down to the bluff again, as the tide was still hopelessly low. None can tell, save those who have tried them, the vexations of those muddy southern streams, navigable only during a few hours of flood-tide. After waiting an hour, the two small vessels again tried the ascent. The enemy on the right had disappeared, but we could now see, far off on our left, another light battery moving parallel with the river, apparently to meet us at some upper bend. But for the present we were safe, and the low rice-fields on each side of us, and the scene was so peaceful, it seemed as if all danger were done. For the first time we saw in South Carolina blossoming river banks and low emerald meadows that seemed like New England. Everywhere there were the same rectangular fields, smooth canals and bushy dikes. A few negroes stole out to us in dugouts and breathlessly told us how others had been hurried away by the overseers. We glided safely on mile after mile. The day was unutterably hot and all else seemed propitious. The men had their combustibles all ready to fire the bridge, and our hopes were unbounded. But, by degrees, the channel grew more tortuous and difficult, and while the little Milton glided smoothly over everything, the Enoch Dean, my own boat, repeatedly grounded. On every occasion of a special need, too, something went wrong in her machinery. Her engine had been constructed on some wholly new patent of which I should hope this trial would prove entirely sufficient. The black pilot, who was not a soldier, grew more and more bewildered and declared that it was the channel and not his brain which had gone wrong. The captain, a little elderly man, sat wringing his hands in the pilot box, and the engineer appeared to be mingling his groans with those of the deceased engine. 
Meanwhile I, in equal ignorance of machinery and channel, had to give orders only justified by minute acquaintance with both. So I navigated on general principles, until they grounded us on a mud bank, just below a wooded point, and some two miles from the bridge of our destination. It was with a pang that I waved to Major Strong, who was on the other side of the channel in a tug, not to risk approaching us, but to steam on and finish the work if he could. Short was his triumph. Gliding round the point, he found himself instantly engaged with a light battery of four or six guns, doubtless the same we had seen in the distance. The Milton was within two hundred and fifty yards. The Connecticut men fought their guns well, aided by the blacks, and it was exasperating for us to hear the shots while we could see nothing and do nothing. The scanty ammunition on our bow gun was exhausted, and the gun in the stern was useless from that position in which we lay. In vain we moved the men from side to side, rocking the vessel to dislodge it. The heat was terrific that August afternoon. I remember I found myself constantly changing places on the scorched deck, to keep my feet from being blistered. At last the officer in charge of the gun, a hardy lumberman from Maine, got the stern of the vessel so far round that he obtained the range of the battery through the cabin windows. But it would be necessary, he coolly added, on reporting the, to me the fact, to shoot away the corner of the cabin, I knew that this apartment was newly painted and gilded, and the idol of the poor captain's heart, but it was plain that even the thought of his own upholstery could not make the poor soul more wretched than he was. So I bade Captain Dolly, blaze away, and thus we took our hand in that little game, though at our sacrifice. It was of no use. Down drifted our little consort round the point, her engine disabled and her engineer killed, as we afterwards found, though then we could only look and wonder. Still pluckily firing, she floated by upon the tide, which had now turned, and when, with a last desperate effort, we got off, our engine had one of its impracticable fits, and we could only follow her. The day was waning, and all its range of possibility had lain within the limits of that one tide. Our previous expeditions had been so successful, it now seemed hard to turn back, the river banks and rice fields so beautiful before seemed only a vexation now. But the swift current bore us on, and after our Parthian shots had died away, a new discharge of artillery opened upon us from our first antagonist of the morning, which still kept the other side of the stream. It had taken up a strong position on another bluff, almost out of range of the John Adams, but within easy range of us. The sharpest contest of the day was before us. Happily the engine and the engineer were now behaving well, and we were steering in a channel already traversed, and of which the dangerous points were known. But we had a long straight reach of river before us, heading directly toward the battery, which, having once got our range, had only to keep it while we could do nothing in return. The rebels certainly served their guns well. For the first time I discovered that there were certain compensating advantages in a slightly built craft, as compared with one more substantial. The missiles never lodged in the vessel, but crashed through some thin partition as if it were paper, to explode beyond us, or fall harmlessly in the water. Splintering the chief source of wounds and death in wooden ships was thus entirely avoided. The danger was that our machinery might be disabled, or that shots might strike below the waterline and sink us. This, however, did not happen. Fifteen projectiles, as we afterwards computed, passed through the vessel, or cut the rigging yet few casualties occurred, and those instantly fatal. As my orderly stood leaning on a comrade's shoulder, the head of the latter was shot off. At last I myself felt a sudden blow in the side, as if from some prize-fighter doubling me up for a moment, while I sank upon a seat. It proved afterwards to have been produced by the grazing of a ball, which, without tearing a garment, had yet made a large part of my side black and blue, leaving a sensation of paralysis, which made it difficult to stand. Supporting myself on Captain Rogers, I tried to comprehend what had happened, and I can remember being impressed by an odd feeling that I had now got my share, and should henceforth be a great deal safer than any of the rest. I am told that this often follows one's first experience of a wound. But this immediate contest, sharp as it was, proved brief. A turn in the river enabled us to use our own stern gun, and we soon glided into the comparative shelter of Wilttown Bluff. There, however, we were to encounter the danger of shipwreck 
superadded to that of fight. When the passage through the piles was first cleared, it had been marked by stakes, lest the rising tide should cover the remaining piles and make it difficult to run the passage. But when we again reached it, the stakes had somehow been knocked away, the piles were just covered by the swift current, and the little tugboat was aground upon them. She came off easily, however, with our aid, and when we in turn essayed the passage, we grounded also, but more firmly. We getting off at last, and making the passage, the tug again became lodged, when nearly past danger, and all our efforts proved powerless to pull her through. I therefore dropped down below, and sent the John Adams to her aid, while I superintended the final recall of the pickets, and the embarkation of the remaining refugees. While thus engaged, I felt little solicitude about the boats above. It was certain that the John Adams could safely go close to the piles on the lower side, that she was very strong, and that the other was very light. Still, it was natural to cast some anxious glances up the river, and it was with surprise that I presently saw a canoe descending, which contained Major Strong. Coming on board, he told me with some excitement that the tug could not possibly be got off, and he wished for orders. It was no time to consider whether it was not his place to have given orders, instead of going half a mile to seek them. I was by this time so far exhausted that everything seemed to pass me by as one in a dream. But I got into a boat, pushed upstream, met presently the John Adams returning, and was informed by the officer in charge of the Connecticut battery that he had abandoned the tug, and, worse news yet, that his guns had been thrown overboard. It seemed to me then, and as always seemed, that this sacrifice was utterly needless, because although the captain of the John Adams had refused to risk his vessel by going near enough to receive the guns, he should have been compelled to do so. Though the thing was done without my knowledge and beyond my reach, yet, as commander of the expedition, I was technically responsible. It was hard to blame a lieutenant when his senior had shrunk from a decision and left him alone, nor was it easy to blame Major Strong, whom I knew to be a man of personal courage, though without much decision of character. He was subsequently tried by court-martial and acquitted, after which he resigned, and was lost at sea on his way home. The tug, being thus abandoned, must of course be burned to prevent her falling into the enemy's hands. Major Strong went with prompt fearlessness to do this at my order, after which he remained on the Enoch Dean, and I went on board the John Adams, being compelled to succumb at last and transfer all remaining responsibility to Captain Trowbridge. Exhausted as I was, I could still observe in a vague way the scene around me. Every available corner of the boat seemed like some vast auction room of second-hand goods. Great piles of bedding and bundles lay on every side, with black heads emerging and black forms reclining in every stage of squalidness. Some seemed ill or wounded or asleep. Others were chattering eagerly among themselves, singing, praying, or soliloquizing on joys to come. Breast de lord, I heard one woman say. I speck I got salt victual now, nothin but fresh victual dee six months. But I's get salt victual now. Thus reversing under pressure of the salt embargo, the usual anticipation of voyagers. Trowbridge told me long after, that on seeking a fan for my benefit, he could find but one on board that this was in the hands of a fat old auntie who had just embarked and sat on an enormous bundle of her goods in everybody's way, fanning herself vehemently and ejaculating as her gasping breath would permit, Oh, do Jesus, oh, do Jesus, when the captain abruptly disarmed her of her fan and left her continuing her pious exercises. Thus we glided down the river in the waning light. Once more we encountered a battery making five in all, I could hear the guns of the assailants, and could not distinguish the explosion of their shells, and the answering throb of our own guns. The kind quartermaster kept bringing me news of what occurred, like Rebecca in front de Bacouf's castle, but discreetly withholding any actual casualties. Then all faded into safety and sleep, and we reached the Beaufort in the morning, after thirty-six hours of absence. A kind friend, who acted in South Carolina a nobler part amid tragedies than in any other early stage of triumphs, met us with an ambulance at the wharf, and the prisoners, the wounded, and the dead were duly attended. The reader will not care for any personal record of convalescence, though among the general military laudations of whiskey 
it is worth while to say that one life was saved in the opinion of my surgeons by the habitual abstinence from it leaving no food for peritoneal inflammation to feed upon the able-bodied men who had joined us were sent to a general gilmore in the trenches while their families were established in the huts and tents on st helena island a year after greatly to the delight of the regiment in taking possession of a battery which they had helped to capture on james island they found in their hands the self-same guns which they had seen thrown overboard from the governor milton they then felt that their account with the enemy was squared and could proceed to further operations before the war how great a thing seemed the rescue of even one man from slavery and since the war has emancipated all how little seems the liberation of two hundred but no one then knew how the contest might end and when i think of that morning sunlight those emerald fields those thronging numbers the old women and their prayers and the little boys with them living burdens i know that the day was worth all it cost and more end of chapter 7 recording by f n h visit www.bookranger.co.uk